Lord, we do come before you with thankful hearts. You are a generous and good and loving God. So would you tune our hearts to thanksgiving? We love you, Lord. Bless this time in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. My name is Deacon Katie. I am really happy to see all of you today, especially as we enter into a holiday week and lots of feasting and family time ahead of us. So it's my joy to be in some hard texts today. I don't know if you picked up on that through some of the readings. This is not um, an easy morning, so just get ready for that. Last Sunday, we celebrated a glorious Vision Sunday, and we still have the balloons out there to prove it. Father Travis cast vision for what God is calling us into as a body of believers in the year 2024. And can I just say how much of a risk we took two years ago when we felt the Lord give us a three-year vision? Of course, we always had open hands that if the Spirit redirected, we'd follow. But committing to one idea, exploring this all-in vision of no grow, and so required commitment and endurance. That alone is testimony to God's faithfulness as we all swim in the waters of a culture that's infatuated with what's next, what's new, what's better, what will hold my attention. But he never changes. His mission in the world has never changed. So as I personally prepare to pivot from year two into year three, I'm especially grateful for a senior pastor who stays the course looks ahead, and trusts God every step of the way. However, while Father Travis got us all excited last week about sowing the message of the gospel and sowing the seeds of faith in others, and while we are diligently praying over our pledge cards for the year 2024, and in fact, if you weren't here last week and didn't grab one, we have one to give you today. As we pray over that pledge card, what of our time, treasures, and talents God may be asking us to commit in the next year, we are indeed still in 2023. We still have the opportunity before us to finish well with what God has been leading in us this year, this year to grow. Today's gospel text, the parable of the talents, is especially appropriate for thinking about growing in the stewardship of our gifts and in our acts of service. So go ahead, grab a Bible that's close to you, open up to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. That's where we'll be for most of this morning. Before we begin with Matthew 25, let's look at where this parable falls in the whole sweep of the Gospel of Matthew. This is not one of Jesus' earliest teachings in Matthew that we find in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. This passage comes after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, in Matthew 21. In fact, Matthew's final discourse in chapters 23 through 25 roughly mirrors the opening discourse in chapters 5 through 7. Both sermons, or a series of teachings, are about the same length, and they both end with the transitional statement, when Jesus had finished saying all these things. However, while the first sermon opens with blessings for the meek, this last sermon opens with woes against the religious elite. Jesus' death is near. The stakes are higher. And there is a greater sense of urgency in his teachings to both his disciples and the crowds. Jesus is not just addressing the scribes and the Pharisees and the Jews. He's also addressing us. This, this message is a warning for Christians. It is for us. If you skim back over chapter 24, you see Jesus foretelling the destruction of the temple, the signs of the end of the age, the abomination of desolation, the coming of the Son of Man in the last days, after the tribulation, the lesson of the fig tree, which indicates when summer or the end is near, and his admonishment that no one knows that day and hour. We clearly have an end times motif going on in this discourse. The end of Jesus' life is quickly approaching, but the end of all things, the day of judgment, the day in which heaven and earth will pass away, are in sight here. 
chapter 25, opens with the parable of the ten virgins. Five who were wise and five who were foolish. The foolish failed to be alert, prepared, ready. They ran out of oil for their lamps, and while they were heading off to buy some more, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. So it's with this idea of preparedness, being ready for when the bridegroom comes in or when the master returns, like in our parable today, that we come to today's text. So, beginning in verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. When Jesus begins here, for it will be, he's picking up from verse 1, the it, referring to the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, for the kingdom of heaven will be like this. A talent was more than 15 to 20 years of a laborer's wages. One talent equaled 6,000 denarii, which we know are the ancient Roman silver coins. And a laborer earned about one denarius a day. A talent was a unit of measurement for weighing precious metals, roughly equal to 75 pounds of silver. Talents are also mentioned in the Old Testament. In Exodus 38, the Israelites used 29 talents of gold in building the tabernacle. In other words, one talent was equal to a huge amount of wealth. It's important to understand that so We don't think the last servant who's only given one talent was entrusted with some meager amount. It's still a good amount. If we are at all familiar with Jesus' parables, we can easily infer that the man mentioned who's going on a journey represents Jesus himself, especially as his actual long journey approaches. Perhaps he is speaking of his ascension, the moment when he leaves the disciples having entrusted them with his life and teachings. And what else does he leave them with? In John 16, 7, Jesus says, But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate, the helper, the counselor, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. So, if the man going on a journey represents Jesus and the servants he entrusts his property to are us, his followers, then what do the talents represent? Is this Jesus' strategic financial advice about trades and investments? How to gain interest and amass wealth? Surely not. And if we know anything about how Jesus uses parables, he uses something earthly to represent something spiritual. Like last week, the parable of the sower is not gardening advice. Before we read on and wonder what the talents represent in our lives and what we are to glean from this parable, I want to first draw your attention to another parable in Matthew that mentions talents, as it might shed light on this question. In Matthew 18, we find the parable of the unforgiving servant. Peter asks Jesus, as he does, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Jesus then goes on to draw the comparison of a king who shows mercy on a desperate servant who owes him 10,000 talents, an absolutely astronomical amount, and completely forgives him that debt. That forgiven servant then goes out and refuses to forgive a fellow servant, a debt of 100 denarii an almost insignificant amount compared to the 10,000 talents. Of course, the merciful king then punishes the unforgiving servant, calling him, you wicked servant. Keep that in mind. We might hear that language again. So what are the talents representing here in this parable? That great, almost unfathomable amount that the king forgives. Our sin. Massive wealth owed to a king, pointing towards our massive failures to keep God's law, all that we have done and left undone are amassed sins, a debt owed to God, paid in full by Jesus. Now in today's parable, 
the talents do not represent sin, but the spiritual significance of the talents and the denarii in the parable of the unforgiving servant ought to prepare our minds to expect an equally spiritual metaphor going on here. So I say all that to encourage us to look past the material gifts given to us by God and dig for something deeper as we investigate what is happening with these three servants. So let's look there together now. Now we're in verse 16. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. While there are clearly some here and now implications in this parable, keep in mind the end times vein that Jesus is teaching in. We have the well done, good and faithful servant spoken over the first two faithful servants as well as the striking statement, enter into the joy of your master, both of which evoke riches and rewards in heaven, eternal bliss and fellowship with their creator, unending joy at the end of all things. This is contrasted with the shocking punishment of the last servant, who is perhaps lazy, clearly afraid, unfaithful. This worthless servant is cast into outer darkness, into a place of eternal punishment and suffering. So with all this in mind, now to discuss what these talents represent for us, how we can apply these scriptures and live in light of them. I will share honestly with you that I really wrestled with how to read this text. And thankfully, I'm not alone, for I found quite a spectrum of interpretations There is no across-the-board consensus from the church fathers to the reformers to contemporary commentators as to how to read this parable and what the talents are. I think maybe the most accessible interpretation is taking the talents and comparing them to our everyday English use of that word. Talents are gifts and abilities. How God has uniquely equipped and called us the work he has given us to do in building his kingdom. As a deacon, I took a vow to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It's part of what I said in my ordination, and I take that charge quite seriously. It's one of my greatest joys in ministry to identify how God has gifted each of you, which of you he has called to teach, to encourage, to pray, who he has gifted with hospitality, administration, a unique ability to connect with children or youth. There's really no greater joy for me than seeing my brothers and sisters flourish in their individual gifts and witnessing how the whole body in turn benefits. I think of how 
Max Tesh and other youth are soaking in everything they can in our audiovisual ministry, serving joyfully and diligently in the booth. Max told me word for word that he feels God has called him to it. Or I think of our table care ministry, and I have to stop calling them the table care ladies because I think we now have our first man serving in that ministry. And I won't shine a spotlight on him now because the very nature of that ministry is to be behind the scenes, but can we thank God for that? I think of our table care ministry and how they are faithfully stewarding their gifts, their attention to detail, their prayerful preparation of the table of the Lord. I could go on and on. Our prayer ministry so faithfully living into their gifts by interceding for the church and for the world. Or Kelly King and how she adds life and beauty and order to everything she touches, especially our growing greenhouse of an atrium. Surely these are beautiful examples of God entrusting us with talents of how the faithful then invest them in the kingdom and how we see the return and are rewarded by God. Faithful stewardship of our time, treasures, and talents, identifying the gifts of the Spirit and living them out. This is good and true and beautiful. However, I'm not sure that this is all the parable of the talents has for us. What especially convinces me of this is the extreme punishment for the unfaithful servant. The extremes of the eternal joys and the eternal suffering granted to the servants accordingly causes me to wonder if some of the alternative interpretations might be more in line with what Jesus had in mind. So what could the talents then represent for us? I want to offer that they are God's mercy, and love. Now, neither of these interpretations necessarily contradict one another. I think instead they deepen and strengthen the meaning of the words of Jesus here, which we know is living and active and speaks to us today. But if the talents given to the servants represent God's mercy and love, we appreciate how weighty of a gift they truly are. The faithful servants who trade the talents given to them and earn back double, are the children of God on whom he poured out his mercy, having been granted all the gifts that come with our salvation, forgiveness of sin, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, our advocate and guide, communion with God, grace upon grace. And we can understand what wickedness it truly is to bury and hide such a gift. In light of the lavish gifts poured out on us, we are to live a life transformed, having been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, pouring out God's mercy and love in works of charity, generosity, service, and sacrificial love. James 2, verses 14 through 21, says this of God's gifts that are buried and hidden away. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Or if someone says that he's been entrusted with talents but shows no return on them? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Said differently, show me your hidden and buried talent And I will show you the talents I've invested in the increase I've experienced, the visible evidence of faithfulness with what I've been entrusted with. The third servant is operating on what we sometimes call cheap grace. He received a gift from his master, mercy and love freely offered to him and buries it, does nothing with it. This is the person who wants to benefit from God's forgiveness of sin, yet takes it from granted and continues sinning. 
This is the Christian who does not follow Christ. And the master has harsh words for this servant. There's a question in our Anglican catechism to be a Christian that was helpful to me in thinking through these hard things. Question 361. Does God's forgiveness excuse you from personal obedience? No. God has reconciled me to himself and freed me from bondage to sin in order to conform me to the image of his son. As I live each day in gratitude for God's forgiveness, I seek to turn from sin and follow Christ in loving obedience. Or we might say, as I live each day in gratitude for the talents the master has entrusted me with, I seek to invest and multiply them in faithful obedience, prepared for his return. So what do we do with this somewhat mysterious and sobering parable? I want to finish by offering three things. One, we live thankful. Two, we live forgiven. And three, we live prepared. First, and especially appropriate for Thanksgiving week, we are to live continually thankful for the gifts God has freely given to us. When we recognize that the five talents, or the two talents, or the one talent we have in our possession were given to us by our Lord, our fists unfurl and we live generously out of our deep gratitude. This is true when we cultivate gratitude for our material gifts and our gifts and abilities, or when we cultivate gratitude for God's scandalous mercy and love. This leads us to worship. Second, we live forgiven. When we keep the cross before us and live as those who have been forgiven much, regularly acknowledging and confessing and turning from our sin, we readily forgive others. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hearkening back once more to the parable of the unforgiving servant. In Luke 7, 44 through 47, Jesus says this of the sinful woman who anointed his feet. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. We have been forgiven much and are therefore to love much. And lastly, we live prepared. The master will return. In just a few weeks, in two weeks actually, we enter into the season of Advent with its beautiful double-layered meaning. On one hand, we come alongside the people of Israel in their desperate longing for a Messiah and remember that he did indeed come incarnate as a baby born to a humble virgin in Bethlehem. However, we also pray in real time, come Lord Jesus. In Advent, we anticipate Christ's second coming in which he will make all things new. The master will return. So today, I want to finish with these words from Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible. Behold, I am coming soon bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. Amen.